Alright. No matter what, like, it seems, I think my room's a problem, isn't it? Anyways, uh, yeah, you're probably gonna hear more echo in my video again today, and I can't seem to figure out what to do to stop that, even when I try stuff with OBS. Anyways, um, yeah, today I'm doing a, uh, One Piece Chapter 1082. It came out a few days ago, surprisingly, because, uh, I guess the Golden Week holidays are going on in Japan. <clears throat> so the official chapter is not even supposed to come out until, um, uh, that'd be about seven days from now. And, uh, yeah, uh, uh, yeah, so I'm a little behind on this because everyone else was, uh, because I, I wasn't feeling too good and I like doing this during the day and this is my day off. So let's get started on this. Uh, so last two chapters, <coughs> and I'm a little sick, so oh, I think I said that. Oh. The last two chapters, um, we focused a lot on uh, Garp and Kobe and everyone and, and how they... Uh, Kobe was trying to escape from Honeycomb Island, and Garp and Sword members arrived, and other people weren't Sword actually. <coughs> like Tashigi was there, and a Kobe successfully is <coughs> after his success had already, with the help of Perona, successfully got out of his uh, cell. Got out of his cell and was trying to escape, and uh, had helped other prisoners. Uh, probably Perona helped that way too, and um, due to uh, the one guy with the island fruit, he knew they escaped right away, and uh, they were trying to figure out how to capture him without uh, causing destruction though, because like, uh, what's his name? Um, shoot, now I should have his name up here. Uh, I don't have the fruit. So, Shiru was... Uh, Saying, asking everyone, like, asking the other guy, like, why aren't you, uh, why aren't you capturing the guy? And he's like, oh, I just, we just, uh, we just fixed Rocky Port, so why would I do that? And, uh, I forget that one's name. Not Vasco Shot. Oh, Pizarro. I can't think of Vasco Shot, but Pizarro. Pizarro's got a devil fruit now where he can, uh, wow, they're, wow, they're really? <laughs> really? Come on. Oh, you sweetheart. Pizarro's fruit is that of um, one that can uh, allow him to control the entire island that he's on. He merges with them <clears throat> into him just like uh, uh, Pika? What's his name from? That's part of Do Doflingo's crew. Uh, actually, I just realized with. Ooh, there's something. With. Um, I got a little theory here. I could. Uh, come on. What? With, uh, I think his name's Pika, the one who had the other fruit. He's probably in prison now. If Vegapunk can make a devil fruit, a replica of that, and give it to some, uh, a, um, one of the other seraphims, that would be really interesting to see how, uh, if they could combat Pizarro's fruit, how that would work. Because those seraphims are intensely powerful themselves. The will, perhaps not the will, the, the, the physicality and whatnot. So, uh, I wonder if, uh, I wonder if that, if that, don't fling the, not don't fling the, if, uh, uh, what do you call it? I wonder if Dolph Flamingo could, ah, oh, shit, Vegapunk could make a devil fruit replica that and that, that, we, that we could see that in the future as a way to help fight Pizarro because he um uh, I'm glad I held off on this last year after the Wano break uh the big break Oda did <clears throat> I was gonna make a video going over potential matchups of the other uh, the other than the less obvious ones uh, of the less obvious ones because we had and, and see how they could match up against, um, like, Jinbei against, uh, oh, uh, let me see here. Come on. So, like, oh, let's see. I was thinking Jinbei against, um, I don't know, Vasco Shot, maybe. Oh, yeah, that would be interesting, because Jinbei controls, has water, Fishman Karate, the other guy turns anything into liquor. Liquor, what, how can he, can he use, can, Jinbei used Fishman Karate against something like that to deflect it. Stuff like that. So anyways, 
Now I, I, but I didn't know about that. We didn't know about Vasco Shot's fruit back then. I can't watch it sprawl here, so I gotta give her space. We didn't know about his fruit back then. Here, sit there. One right there. So I, me doing that uh, in that way would not have been a very good way, to, uh, a good video, to, uh, a, vid uh, a video now that I would, uh, I would have to update once we had all these fruits and maybe re <coughs> set up. The matchups, other than like I said, the so the obvious ones are like Van Auger against uh, Usopp, Shiru against Zoro, <coughs> uh, Jesus Burgess probably against uh, against uh, Frankie. Although I still can't figure out who would fight. Uh, if San Juan Wolf is the one, I'm not sure like how they can fight him. Oh, what if Ors comes back? What if they can find an Ors that's bigger? There's another thing. What if they can use Or? What if they gave a... Oh. What if someone... What if... Um, what if Vegapunk tried to make a Seraphim out of an Ors blood? He dupl he cloned Ors the third and made a Seraphim. Holy shit. And then... Because Sanron was probably already in the... Um, Sanron was already in the... Power level six. All these new captains are from level six. Pizarro, uh, Shot, Wolf. What if uh, Vegapunk already has his um, DNA and he's keeping he's keeping it in the lab somewhere? Of course, it could have just got it destroyed now. And he can make a serum of ores, and then give it San Juan's green blood as there's powers through the green blood. <clears throat> then we have a way to fight him or San Juan. Because I can't see how it's still gonna be him. They don't have, hey, you are not doing it, do that. She about to knock that camera over. Stop it, sit with me. You're gonna break the camera and I can't get a new one yet. I gotta wait till next, Here, you gotta go down. Here, get in your chair. Get your chair. Yeah, get in your chair. Silly cat, every time I record a video. So, uh, yeah. Because uh, I, I've seen, we have seen though that Alogias, like uh, Alogia, like a, a, a Kainu, uh, Akiji, <clears throat> he froze San Juan in a, a flashback we saw last chapter uh, a year ago when he first met the Blackbeard Pirate. Oh, yeah, I should take this off. Yeah. So, uh, so, um, come on. Oh, you want to play now? You shouldn't. So anyways, yeah, I was glad I didn't do a video doing matchups of the of the straw hats because uh, I can't uh, can't really do that now. Can't really do that right now with uh, I couldn't do that before because of that. You're gonna have to sit in your chair. Come on, you're gonna knock stuff over. There's just not enough room here. I'll try to here. I'll make room for you. I'll try to make some room for you. And you can't knock over the camera. There, there's plenty of room right here, sweetie. Um, where was I going before that? So, uh, I should pull up this too. Um, so yeah, we saw, we so really what we're going, I think right now, Oda hasn't really stated it, but this is basically our intermission of the uh, <clears throat> Egghead arc. It started with like the end of 1079, I would think right with um, where Shanks and uh, uh, Kid fought, and then we had well, what happened next? Uh, Ten seventy nine, yeah. Uh, then um, yeah, so then we we, we switched over to uh, we saw what's going on with Shanks. Now we see what's going on with Kobe and uh, Garp, <coughs> and we saw that, and now we switched over to. Uh, so the so also it's interesting at the end of the other chapters Oda is and end of some of these other chapters he's um, given us other things going on as well like uh, what's going on with uh, well we saw the beginning of Kid and, Kid and Blackbeard fighting then we saw where happened to Sabo was that when that then we saw what happened and I think it was ten seventy four where we saw where Wapple and uh, VVR but now he's just full on. Up until this point, has been uh, spent three whole chapters not showing anything going on in Egghead, and uh, 
Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. You have a weird cut there. So, anyways, um, now yeah, now we're back to um. Also, we, we last thing we saw a little bit of what Aokiji, uh, Aokiji and Garp's relationship in this interaction in the last chapter, ten eighty one, where Aokiji, uh, it's hard to say for sure, but the way he talked here, if he's really undercover. I'm starting to second guess this undercover business with that everyone's been um, uh, speculating since we found out he left uh, the Marines, uh, probably what was that, in Fishman Island arc or so, uh, so like 400 chapters ago, so years ago, we found out about this and we've been speculating about this and we've only seen him a couple times. We saw, though, although we saw him help Smoker against Doflamingo at the end of Punk Hazard, so, uh, yeah, it's just the way he interacted with Garp there was very interesting because he seemed upset. Oh. <clears throat> oh <my. coughs> he seemed very upset with uh, Garp for like how how are you gonna are you gonna are you, are you gonna sacrifice your 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 best protege against your new your new one that kind of thing, and so. Uh, yeah, that's where we left off of that. So we'll start. This chapter, Oda spends some more time again. Um, oh, stop it. This is sad. This time, Kuzan, uh, Oda spends more time uh, going around to some other parties and what's going on to, instead of a, again, this feels like what happened in Wano where uh, he did those little intermissions uh, and he was doing it in like a play, that one play that's done. Um, it's definitely doing this again inst instead of waiting till after the chapter to um, uh, let us see what the reaction is to stuff happening in the world. Uh, well, and uh, the closest thing we had to this before also like was like Doflamingo's art. We had other parties on the island, and we were trying to figure out what the hell was going on. We had uh, Admiral Fujitora there, and uh, the Cypherpol Zero agents were there. But uh, now instead, Oda said, take a break and have to let us know what's going on. Which is awesome because this, uh, I've, I've stated this in some of my past video, other reviews. This feels more like what an author would do in other books. Most other books, uh, books like, uh, like Dan Brown or some other authors, they would flip over, they would go around to, um, let's see here. They'd go around, with, they'd spend other chapters. Technical issues. It's a bit pain. He'd go around other chapters and find show what else is going on with. Um, no, you are not going to do that. With other characters in the in the arc, in that story, like if someone's pursuing them, the other bad guys going on. Uh, Oda, not Oda. Dan Brown would like show us what's going on, and Oda hasn't done much of that stuff in this. Uh, in the um, in one piece until except between sagas, so like at the end of uh, uh we didn't see anything about Mar Marine's reaction to Luffy fighting all these different criminals in the East Blue until he defeated Arlong and then gave him his first bounty and then on and on and on after Alabasta after uh, after Skypea and then Ennis Lobby was a big confrontation. So anyways, yeah, I spent way too much in a pretense here. So now, uh, we start out this chapter, and there's still no cover stories. Oda's doing these fan requests, and it's a cute one here of Chopper, uh, Chopper trying to eat Zeus, uh, Nami's new cloud, who's the, the homie from Big Mom, <coughs> and, uh, because he thinks it's cotton candy. So anyways, just checking. Um, we start out this chapter by finding out that there has been a casualty in the Marine ranks due to the Cross Guild's plan, Crocodile and Mihawk's plan to shake up the world. They, uh, someone had killed uh, Vice Admiral T-Bone, uh, and we saw him, this, uh, who's a, this is a officer, I think he might have been a captain back at Eni's lobby. He was on board the train acting as kind of a rear guard, I think he was. So, when, um, if I remember correctly, when once the uh, Cypher Paul had got Robin to come with them, they were sitting in the, fr the fr more front cars of the train, heading back to Eni's lobby, and, and T-Bone, if I recall correctly, was 
back there with a uh, like maybe a can a platoon or a, a whatever of marines in the back, <clears throat> and he tried to stop the straw hats from uh, coming. And I don't recall like how the confrontation ended. I was trying to watch those episodes a few weeks ago, but I didn't finish what that ended there, so I can't. And I can't recall from the manga off the top of my head. But he was still alive. And I think the last time we saw him alive was when he made a report to Fleet Admiral Akainu uh, where, about where Fujitora was. Because uh, Akainu was pissed that Fujitora didn't catch the Straw Hats at Dress Rosa and ordered him not to go to uh, Marijua or any. He couldn't come back until he completed the job and T-Bone was reporting his whereabouts to Akainu. So that was probably a couple hundred chapters ago, and now he's been killed, and um, and now he's yeah he's a vice admiral now. Oh, was he? Wasn't he a little? I don't know now. But he um. I heard oh, I heard someone say he was a I think I heard he was a rear admiral, last we saw him. But uh, anyways, he um. I have to put my glasses on a little bit here. He's, uh, we see a, from a newspaper that he's been killed, and that, uh, so we go from this, we see, we're seeing now the reactions of this from the, the, the uh, point of view of, uh, Sengoku and Suru. They are, um, they are sitting at, uh, the Navy HQ, and they are in, a, like, a, a, a cafeteria together, Talking about how this is going to affect the morale, basically, of the uh, of the uh, the Marines and that stuff. So they start actually in the conversation, like Sengoku was fine asking, "Do we know who caught? Have they caught who did it?" And uh, oh, no. <coughs> <coughs> and uh. Yeah, this is a. I, I, I like this bit too because this brings up something that um, Sengoku I think has not faced. Well, he, he says to Suru, What's the world coming to that we can't even trust the civilians we are sworn to protect and they're going to stab us in the back? And I would like to point out to you that there is no matter how much you guys are working hard to protect things, you are working for the world government, Sengoku. <clears throat> they are not. An equal, they are not, not equal, they are not taking care of everyone the way you think. There, there, there isn't a prosperity everywhere. <clears throat> there, um, as we'll find out why this guy did this, the one who killed T Bone. There isn't prosperity everywhere. You, you're under the thumb. A lot of these, I bet a lot of these other countries would love to defect. Uh, like, like we saw that eight of them now have defected uh, through the revolutionaries' influence, and now the friggin' Uh, the tr Lucia has been taken off the map, and, and it's possible the other ones are going to be next, if not gone already. <clears throat> These people don't want to all be there. Some of those ones are probably quite powerful too, in their own right, like self-sufficient. Maybe they got their own a good economy with their neighbors. They got their own. Uh, so we already seen that to some extent too that some of the other uh, 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 nations here have their own uh, a fleet of ships to help protect themselves from pirates and probably protect their commerce, their, their, their uh, ships spreading, taking goods to and from neighbors, uh, trade, the trade routes, it's like, there would probably be like trade routes, say from uh, Alabasta to uh, Water 7 or, I'm trying to think better though, like in the different blues, there's some, we don't have a lot of knowledge of the other nations up there though, that those places especially would have their own uh, fleet of ships. And so they're self-sufficient, but they're under the military. They're under the protection of the world government because they've been there for hundred under them for hundreds of years. But they have to pay a tribute too. So basically, even though <coughs> you, uh, they're taxed uh, uh, for what sounds like an exorbitant amount, so it's very hard for some of these other nations, like the one Kaido came from, to you know uh, pay for that money. And uh, uh, some of those nations, I think Kaido's homeland was like that, where they couldn't kind of protect themselves from uh, other pirates, and uh, I'm surprised Kaido couldn't become a protector for them. But I think he was just too, too much of a, a violent, free spirit type of thing. And they tried; they got rid of him by giving him to the Marines. <clears throat> but um, yeah, Sengoku. 
he's been in the Marines so long, and I think I would say too, at a, such a high level probably for a very long time that he's not looking at the things from the views of some of these civilians in other nations that are not <clears throat> not doing well. Maybe this nation, I don't really know if they showed here, but I feel like this nation that this guy, where this place came from that killed Tebow, and they probably um, were not a place protected by the, I gotta check in, protected by the uh, world government. Yeah, they never really point out where this place is, but this guy's family, we find, as we find out here, was starving, and so he did this. They did this out of desperation to get the money that Crossgo was offering for someone of, uh, of uh, T-Bone's rank. And we don't know what rank, how many stars that would be. Uh, or maybe we would. <coughs> uh, we'd have to check. But Kobe, because I remember Kobe had like five stars, but that was because he was a hero. Maybe T-Bone's status was similar to that. So let's say even like three stars, that would be like 300 million berries. Uh, so those people are going to be really well off. Their they're they're great grandkids and that will be well off if they don't blow that money. So, um, uh, oh wait, they do talk about this one kingdom here. So Suru talks about this kingdom called the Pepe Kingdom where a thousand people die of your starvation. Now again, I'm wondering if this is a nation that's not part of the world government. Uh, uh, so Suru's just kind of like pointing out why this seems to be happening. She, she's understanding. She's trying to point out to Sengoku this. And um, of course, she said, I'm not defending who it happened and stuff. But this is, was, but she's kind of saying like this was bound to happen because people need money. And if, if a group rise up like this to do this, uh, they're gonna take advantage of it because it's it's not there's no ec uh, not equity. The pro again the prosperity is not really great in these, some of these places. And also and then Son Goku and then Son Goku's next point is like we have to get rid kick out this cross guild soon otherwise that's why he brings up the morale of the uh, Marines will be uh, diminished. <coughs> so next. Uh, we end the scene with, uh, <laughs> what's her name? Um, oh, Hina, that's her name. So Hina, uh, who's this other, um, I forget her rank too. She was one, I think, from, um, when she first shown it back in uh, Alabaster. Hina's walking into this area, and Sengoku and uh, Suru see her and ask what Garp is. And this is where the news gets to them uh, that Garp has gone to rescue Kobe. It's, this, it's funny, too, because Hina doesn't seem upset by this, but when she reveals this news to uh, Sengoku and uh, Suru, they are freaking out. As Suru, uh, uh, a little extra, you could say, because her granddaughter has decided to join Garp's expedition, excursion to save, um, <laughs> save him. So uh, <clears throat> it's funny, though, that Hina just makes this go, sound so casual. Like, oh, yeah. He went to, he went there and he's gonna he he left a little bit ago saying he was gonna save Kobe. <laughs> so the uh, the next scene we hear, do here the the main this is like and this is the um, uh, the third scene the the bigger one in terms of uh, 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 pages here we get uh, uh, what's the name of the island I don't really remember the name but the island where uh, Buggy is here. We see the man who who took, brought in T Bone's body and probably killed him. Although, yeah, he must have snuck up on T Bone. Or uh, I've heard other people saying that T Bone probably would have not harmed civilians, so maybe he didn't put up a fight properly. But this guy's an old man, with very disheveled and dirty clothing, and um, he he thanks the, he thanks Buggy for giving uh, saving his family. Of uh, the payment, <clears throat> he heard his family got it, and uh, Buggy is doing his very bombastic type of portrayal again, the the wizard Oz type stuff, and uh, and he's like thanking him for like he he he's doing this because all the other pirates his crew are there too. It's like yeah, you did great, and you 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 did what we needed to. Also, you shocked the Marines; they weren't expecting that, and. Um, 
But then Buggy points out, oh, these, they're probably going to come after you for this. And then they basically say, you can become one of us now, and we'll protect you from being uh, killed um, uh, by the Marines, or being arrested by the Marines. <clears throat> and the other guy's like, well, uh, that's sad, I'll never see my family again, but at least they'll, um, at least they'll uh, be well off now. Prop this up so I can see this better. Oh, I know what I gotta do. Hold on. This is hard to do with this reflection. So, um. So these, the, the pirate, uh, Buggy's crew, Buggy's crew here, uh, Get uh, start cheering for Buggy because they still think this is his plan. They they still obviously they are probably never gonna realize that this is not his plan in the least. They 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 fall into into his <clears throat> his silver tongue abilities to persuade him, make himself seem great. Which also was aided by the fact that he knows Shanks when they saw him talking to Shanks two years ago. They're like, oh, he's he's casually talking to Shanks. He's the greatest thing ever. And they start cheering Buggy here. And uh, so then we get a uh, then we get a, a, a one of the other pirates comes in uh, a, a shipwright apparently that Buggy has under his employ and they've completed the construction of a ship that will be used as the cross guild like pirate flagship or such. I wonder if they'll make like a fleet. How they'll do that if they just have the one. I don't know how many people Buggy has. I feel like one ship would not be enough for all his. And men under his employ, they probably have to have their own ships and stuff. But this would be like the main one for a buggy, uh, uh, well, crocodile, Mihawk. But uh, yeah, we see a brief flashback here that uh, this is uh, the crocodile Mihawk want us. To, we're talking about planning it to make a ship, and Buggy's like, "Well, I got the ship rights here. Let me just have the gift of job over to them." But they're not happy about what the the people made. It, it, well, Buggy probably would be under normal circumstances, but uh, <laughs> the ship, part of it looks impressive, but the other parts, so the ship has Buggy's, uh, a bust, a wooden pry bust of Buggy's face with the big hat he's wearing, smiling on the front, the maiden, is that the maiden head, the front of the ship, and underneath it though, it's got two swords crossing together like the cross guild, that's the part that looks cool. I think they should just lop off that part. Mihawk should just take this Yoru and just lop off that, um, lop off that bit there and just have it, this cross guild part moved up. It'll look much better. And the ship's got like a, a tent in there, a big top tent, I guess, or like the, like a circus thing, because motif with Buggy being a clown, I guess. Uh, and the, the shipwrights and the other workers are all really proud of what they show they have here. And, uh, yeah, they're just really proud of what they got here. And, um, uh, Buggy's freaking out because he, he knows what's about to happen here. Um, <laughs> wait, I, just, yeah, I wish I could put this TV. Yeah, so anyways, um, <laughs> so behind Buggy, you just get that, you, I see that this is done with other like anime and manga where like just the obvious presence of the other characters, the murderous intent you could say when they're upset happens right behind Buggy. He's he's crying there, and they're behind him with that boom kind of like looking there, uh, saying like you expect us <laughs> to to ride around in that, and Buggy's just like okay guys the. Uh, we're gonna have a meeting with um, my my uh, crocodile Mihawk and I are gonna have a uh, meeting. I go to a meeting room. Thanks for uh, all your hard work. Hold on. So uh, <laughs> so we go back to the uh, meeting room. <clears throat> Actually, something interest of interest to me here. Uh, when I look at Buggy's big uh, his big um, uh, circus tent ones that, that he so Buggy I, I forgot Buggy has all these big circus tent things as his. Like instead of buildings on this island, and uh, the main one that sh is shown here, and I'm, I'm certain it was shown before, but we found out about Buggy being a warlord, uh, has his logo on it, or maybe this is new Cross Guild version too, kind of. It has a uh, Buggy's 
uh, like instead of like Buggy's face, like see the the one that shows Buggy that they just made looks like his face like in the flesh. But this one on top of the the big uh, main uh, tent there <clears throat> is a a skull with the clown nose, his hat. Actually, it looks more like a cap, regular captain's hat. Not so nothing as big as the one he wears now. Well, kind of similar, similar design, and that, and two swords behind it. That, that one would have looked a little better, I think, than the way they the shipwrights put on his ship. It looks like it's too big to be just taken and replaced on the other one too. You can see that buggy ship, that new ship right there in this scene. Where it's a pull-out shot, like of of everything and so we switched back to the main meeting room and you can see that must be the buggy's main crew members again they, they know what's going on just like before you know just you can see them looking at the door and he's just screaming in there probably in pain because in the next shot we see that they've uh mihawk and crocodile put his head up tied it to a hook but through it with his hair and they've beat the snot out of him again his right eyes all swelled up and everything and uh He's just there saying, kill me, just stop doing this. <laughs> uh, I feel a little bad there that they do that, that much to him. And uh, so, while he's doing that, Crocodile and uh, Mihawk are having their little self a meeting about what happened with like T-Bone being killed and how this has helped push forward what they want. Uh, and, and realizing their threat there, which kind of is obvious anyways because they're both such a notorious peak, uh, criminals to the government, you know, with Mihawk being uh, uh, someone who used to hunt the Marines personally, and Crocodile, of course, because of his uh, alabaster crimes, <clears throat> and whatever he did before, uh, they talk about, uh, then, uh, now we get to uh, Crocodile's, because uh, uh, this must be myth, mostly his plan, but I think Mihawk's going along with this because It'll help him be safe from the Marines because his warlord status is gone and he, he didn't like being chased. He thought it would be fun at first when they first took away his warlord status uh, about 100 chapters ago. We saw him really ex ex over 100 chapters and he was really excited and then, we realized, and then he realized, oh, this is boring. Uh, I was surprised they didn't send better admirals, uh, like rear admirals, vice admirals after him instead. Or maybe they did and he cuts them down. Like, someone like Garp should have went after him, basically, is what I'm saying. Um, so anyways, uh, Crocodile here is expanding upon his, the plan, and uh, he wants, uh, so this looks like he's an extension of what he wanted to do before, where he was going to turn Alabasta into, like, his little utopia. And, um, and he wants to basically create his own independent uh, state, and he calls it a military state in this translation, which makes me wonder, like, meaning, I think mostly he just means we have to make sure we have enough, like, resources and men and other, bring in other people. Because <clears throat> I think he, what he's talking about is he wants to create a separate state. And, and what's interesting is this almost sounds similar to what Blackbeard has done by taking over Fullerton Island and making it his little pirate paradise or whatever. And um, I think Crocodile's trying to plan something like that. Although I don't know if he'll want to just make it full of pirates that are drinking and fighting and pissing and falling all over the way. I'm sure full that island is full of mostly like um, these pirates that just, it's like, uh, what was that actual pirates uh, place in the, was it Nassau? Uh, I played that Assassin's Creed four years ago and there was like that part later where it was like everything, people were getting sick and it was just not, they weren't keeping the town up to date. Up, up keeping it and it was becoming a problem and I think full lead's gonna become like that here so anyways uh, yeah crocodile so while they're continuing this uh, conversation uh, Mihawk's asking, like, okay, so to do this stuff, we're, we, we're going to need to gather, like, is that him saying it? No. No, I think, uh, wait a sec. Yeah, uh, <clears throat> I think it's Crocodile saying, like, we need to gather enormous amounts of wealth. Uh, 
And when he's cut off here by Buggy, so we, as we're cut off here already, uh, uh, Buggy cuts him off and says, and tries to give some advice here, and he's like, uh, Um, so Buggy cuts him off here and says, I know I'm out of line and whatnot, and you're, you're probably killing me, but you're not doing this the right way, because you're pirates. And like, and, and how can you call yourself pirates doing this, thing, this way? It's, it's backward. And this really pisses off the other two. And uh, uh, Mihawk in his translation calls him a cockroach. Like, what are you saying to us, cockroach? You're not, you're not fit to be part of this meeting. You're only in here to, for the effect that we have, we need to keep your men in line. <clears throat> so, uh, what is that, nunchucks? So he goes on here, oh, this is like a torture room. Holy shit. Ugh, look at there's all, that's where they are. So Ike goes on here to, to say, like, point out, like, the Yonko, like, red hair, are making a move now. Uh, and I know where he is. He's going to go for the One Piece. Cause I knew, used to work with him. I used to be with him on his crew. And uh, <clears throat> he's like, so you guys must have, when, when you went out to sea, you must have wanted to be uh, King of the Pirates too, right? Do you remember why you went out to sea? He, so he's pointing out here, he starts to kind of point out like they, the way they're doing things is not the way they probably would have done things 20 years ago. Especially something like, like this. And this is definitely applicable to Crocodile because we know him and then he went out to sea to become king of the pirates. So we get a flashback here that elaborates on that day of when uh, when Roger died. This is that evening. <clears throat> and we saw a bit of this fight uh, back at um, yeah when uh, Whitebeard and Shanks were talking together after um, Annie's lobby. They were they they parted ways, Buggy and Shanks, and this elaborates on that. So Buggy here too says, wait a minute, how's that going? I gotta reread these better. <coughs> so what Buggy's pointing out here is that too is that back at the end of uh when Roger uh, had uh when Roger had uh, been executed and made that procla proclamation about the one piece, even Buggy was inspired to want to become King of the Pirates. But he knew, he knew he wasn't going to have a chance back then because of Shanks. He saw Shanks' potential. And uh, I was actually trying to think about what potential did he see, but my, I, my main guess is Shanks was probably already showing great proficiency with his swordsmanship, and he was, getting, he was obviously going to be really strong. Like, you can see in One Piece world how there are some humans, you know, like Shanks or Zoro or Mihawk, that they are extremely physically powerful uh, and you know, even Do Flamingo to an extent, he's not, he can't hold a candle to some of these other people now that the top tier. But then you got people, you got these average citizens, you got Buggy, uh, you got other, other pirates here, They're, they can't measure up to that, They're, they don't have that super strength. So I'm assuming Buggy's referencing primarily that, uh, that Shanks as a boy was already, he's probably being trained by Ro, uh, Roger and uh, Rayleigh <clears throat> and who's shown his proficiency. So he talks about how. Uh, he, he, so he became kind of upset here with Shanks. Actually, this is a little confusing because he, uh, because he said he let go of his real dream. It doesn't sound like he, it sounds like he didn't do it yet then. Because the way it's, this is framing it, I, the way I was understanding it is Shanks, because Shanks here starts saying that uh, that same day, he's not going to immediately try and claim the One Piece. He wants to put that on the back burner. And this pisses off Buggy back then. And my thoughts on this was that he's, Buggy wants like a rival, or like a proper rival in a way, or he's kind of like, at the same time, it almost sounds like he wanted, he was hoping Shanks would be the King of the Pirates, because he knew Shanks would be a good King of the Pirates somehow, so a good person, I suppose you could say, because Shanks, I think I've stated this before, but I'll, uh, it's worth bringing up, I don't think Shanks, <clears throat> much like the Straw Hat crew, I don't think Shanks and his crew are really operating as pirates. They're labeled as such by the world government, but I don't think they operate that way. So if he was king of the pirates, it would be the kind of good example of a, a king, as it were. 
an example of how he, he would be setting a bet, good example, whereas if Kaido and Big Mom were king and queen, respectively, of the pirate of the pirates, <clears throat> it would be just, oh, uh, this is the influence. They, they, well, they're, they, they do whatever they want. They, they terror, t terrorize and, 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 and take over places and abuse their children and whatnot. We can do the same thing. Whereas if you had Shanks or Luffy as king of the pirates, it's going to be a quite different uh, thing. So... Buggy here, <clears throat> yeah. Buggy here seems like he's quite a. I should sit back a little too. Buggy here seems like he's um. He's uh. He he wanted Shanks to almost be the king of the pirates more than at that point. Uh, so like when Shanks pointed out to this to Buggy back then, I'm not gonna do it yet. Shanks, uh, Buggy seem, seems to have lost quite a bit of respect for him at that moment, because he, because he looked up, he kind of was looking up to Shanks as to be the, the new king of the pirates uh, after their, <clears throat> after Roger died, because he, and he even sits, even points at Shanks and says, "Don't you care about following in our captain's footsteps?" Uh, so and then he ends the chapter by just running away, being very pissed at Shanks and. Saying things about how I won't forgive you for these other things you did to me too. You gave me this fruit. You just lost, I lost that treasure map I had, and uh, so he's been mad. At, he's been claiming he was mad at Shanks all this time about that, but he really this seems to be what he was mad most was that Shanks never uh, properly rose up to be to take that to take the throne right away. Although where he is at now is very good, so I don't know why he'd be that upset. But so. So Buggy here too is pointing out that he has he gave up he basically did give up on his dream <clears throat> probably because he knew he couldn't take on people like Shanks and Kaido or whatnot. So he he he's like the smart one. He looking at him. This is also neat with a contrast to Mihawk and Crocodile. The three of them have like a neat little contrast to each other where uh, <clears throat> it's about their motivation, their, their ambition, and their strength. Like. So Buggy here clearly points out like he is not not in so many words, but that he uh, that he knew he wasn't strong enough to fight to take on the top tier people like maybe even Crocodile, uh, Dolph Lango, etc. Who and, and then obviously like Mihawk and Shanks to be king of the pirates, and he kind of points out to them, he's kind of uh, saying to them too that you guys. Could have become king of the pirates compared to me. Like, why have you lost that ambition to do that? <clears throat> Actually, in some way, Shanks, uh, uh, Mihawk doesn't look like someone who ever had it. He's been uh, not complacent, but he's just uh, satisfied where he is. He he hunted pirates. He he fought Shanks. He he's probably upset that she can't fight Shanks anymore. But um, he has the strength to be the king of the pirates. He 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 could fight Big Ma. He could fight Kaido. It was always interesting how that we had so many of these warlords that were like don't see the balance to the Yonko, but only like really when it came down to it, like Mihawk and Kuma maybe as well <clears throat> could and uh, Blackbeard obviously did it temporarily, but I'm talking about before Blackbeard. The uh, only Kuma I think Mihawk could have stood up to um, to uh, the 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 Yonko. I take a call there. So where was I? Um, so this is basically what. Shanks too, and starts saying here. Oh, what did I say? Oh, I think Shanks here is trying to humiliate a little bit, but uh, Crocodile and Mihawk in a way, like get them to like reinvigorate them. Even though I think it still won't work with Mihawk, uh, but this is definitely something that seems to be a sour point, uh, a touchy point, I should say, to um, uh, Crocodile because he definitely had that dream a long time ago, but he gave up on it. Uh, no, well, he didn't really give up on it, really. He went about it by a different mean. His plan was he took a, he went down a long term plan to take out Whitebeard by trying to find Pluton, and he just he uh, he knew he needed to have resources and uh, and uh, the manpower to take over Alabaster where he suspected it was, and he had Nico Robin there eventually to help him read it. <coughs> uh, but I I don't know if this means what he's doing now means he still doesn't want to be king of the pirates. But Buggy seems to think so. So what he's also pointing out here too is like we should go after the One Piece rather than do the things you want to do. You're doing it your way, the way you're trying to. And then 
we can have then it'll be way easier to have what you uh, want to do here to have this military state, the state create your own country, I'm going to call it. I think that's what Crocodile was really talking about. And then Buggy finishes this off too by saying, now that I'm in this position, I, I, I don't know how, what kind of, the, what kind of luck of God's brought me here, but, uh, or chance, but now that I'm on equal footing with Shanks, I'm going to have, bring back my dream and believe in my dream of being king of the pirates again. I also, I, actually, I think that it could be part of the reason this crocodile looks really pissed here when Buggy says that. I think more crocodile's more upset because he probably still does want to be king of the pirates, and he doesn't want Buggy to get it. He doesn't want to f keep this charade going on for so long where Buggy looks like he's uh, uh, crocodile's boss. I, I think that's really what pisses crocodile off here. Yeah, so they, they do say that basically. The two of them, the both of them are like, we're not, uh, we're not gonna let you, uh, we're not carrying you to the top. We're gonna, we're only, we're doing this because it benefits us. And then, uh, how did he get that? So Buggy here is talking. He's got a Denden Moshi here that is, uh, uh, it connects to other ones that that people can hear where he has like a. He can talk to them to like uh, they're like school loudspeakers or whatever, and uh, he starts making his speech so that these, his men can hear it. And um, let me see here. He starts his speech by saying, asking his men like, "What what drove you to come out to see?" And the people, his crew, start realizing what he's up to. Like, oh, he's he's gonna inspire us. This is why we love him so much. And um, Oh, I'm sorry. I have to go back a little bit. After he yells at them, after they yell at him about, uh, uh, like, we're not going to go carry to the top, they also point out, like, um, we're not playing pirates. We're doing this seriously. We're, we're not here to play your con. And uh, the Mihawk points out, like, you want us to fight those uh, the other Yonko? And uh, so he's, he even says the names, like, Luffy... Not Luffy, he says red hair, black beard, and straw hat. Do you expect us to fight those people? And Buggy just says, no, we don't have to fight them. We just have to, let's just beat them to the uh, One Piece. But <laughs> Buggy's clearly not thinking that through, even though he's trying to inspire these two. Because now we know, we know as an audience, and the other Yonko know, you have to have those road poneglyphs. And at this point, you'd have to get those rubbings or do what the Straw Hats have already done and go to these other places and get the rubbings, make rubbings yourself, which means going back to Whole Cake Island or to Wano, and this Wano would probably be a lot easier at this point. But uh, uh, he, I, he seems like he's not, the, 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 what I'm getting at is Mihawk is right, essentially, that they would have to fight the others because they need to find a way to get those rubbings to get there. They can't just circumvent everyone and just go there because you don't know where to go. Unless Buggy knows how to do go there still somehow. But he said earlier he's never been there. Circumstances prevented him and Shanks from going to Lafto, so probably not really. So anyways, yes, he gives his big speech and he gets his he does this to get Crocodile and force Crocodile. This is pretty really clever of him too. I don't know if he thought this through uh, on a whim or he thought ahead of this when they were when they, he kept hearing them over the last probably, probably been a couple weeks here, they've been doing this meetings and talking about their plan, and maybe he concocted this. But he basically coerces, makes it where Crocodile and Mihawk have to help him now, because he tells his men, "We're gonna finally go get the One Piece," and uh, and uh, but he does this great speech with like, "What made you come out to see? What do you desire most?" Let's. Uh, yeah, he goes on like if you if you gave up like I did, then because then, it was too daunting. But now now it's not. We're in, within sight of that. Let's let's do this. It's like so. It's a good speech, and it it's a really interesting scene there. Now, and I actually I was I this brought up something that was bugging me the last uh, for weeks now with um 
I imagine at some point Shiru and I was thinking about that Shiru and Mihawk would probably end up fighting someday, but and then, like I, I don't maybe I've heard someone else say this before, but something about like Shiru would become the world's strongest swordsman, like he would take a f title from Mihawk. But Shiru right now is kind of like just following teachers goals he's working under him and I was thinking how would they ever fight because Mihawk was a warlord up until recently and he um oh sorry I had a cough again he um Mihawk's a warlord Shiro's working under as a captain under Marsh Teach as what is Keith then he's like the Commodore uh so I was thinking, how would Shiru and uh, Mihawk ever face each other? Because I don't know if Shiru has a, a, a just uh, dedicated, uh, like, like he wants to be king, uh, the world's strongest swordsman. But I, I thought maybe that someday they would fight that fight, and then Mihawk would lose, and then she, uh, Rosoro would be kind of like avenging uh, Mihawk. But now this brings up, up a, par, a potential way, I think, where they can fight each other, because. If they both say teachers crew and this cross guild end up meeting at like Laftel, like I have a feeling Oda's gonna find a way for a lot of people to start ending up at Laftel at once before the Straw Hats. Like even if Shanks and like not even so say for instance now that sh uh, in a little bit that we that when the Straw Hats have all the rope on the list, I imagine Teach and Shanks are gonna have them all too. And the initial thought would be like those three will just uh, converge on the island, but I doubt it would just be them. I think a lot of other forces are actually gonna. The Marines are gonna start coming. The uh, uh, Luffy's allies will have to start coming. Stuff like that was gonna be a big clusterfuck basically. And um, all right. Anyways, I, this is, could be where now where if Cross Guild and Teach's crew reach the island first, say before even like Shanks and Luffy. Then we can probably see Shiru and Mihawk fight. This would be uh, just a, a, a potential way. This is a potential way I see now for them to interact as Shiru's probably one of the best swordsmen in the world right now. Uh, I would say he's definitely the only one right now still on, on par uh, with Shanks and Mihawk. That Zoro still is not quite there, but will soon. So I'll be cool to see them fight, obviously. So now we get to the last scene of the chapter, and um, <clears throat> just have this ready in case I got sneeze. Um, we go to um, the uh, Kabubaka Kingdom, where the revolutionaries have been hanging out, uh, hanging out here. We're not hanging out, based here for a while, and uh, we meet four new characters here. Um, I don't think wait, were they shown before, but maybe not named. And we see these four new characters who are. Watching, uh, doing like lookout duty or something on the edge of the island, and there's a ship coming. <clears throat> uh, oh look! So we see these guys saying, "Who's this? Who, who's on the ship? Do you think it's an enemy?" The one person thinks it could be an enemy, and we get little title cards for them. So we have one who's uh, also. I gotta get their, I have their captains up here. Cause these guys, we find out these guys are the, uh, the vice captains to, um, dragons. So the subordinates directly under Cap Dragon, he's got, other than Ivanka, he's got those four, um, each one's from a different blue, <coughs> has been operating one of the blues. So they're, they're designated as an Ari from each of those directions. And we got, uh, uh, we had, uh, let's see, Morley, Limber. Bell, Betty, and Kasuru. Right, and Ivankov's part of the Grand Line Army. He heads that stuff. So the, um, we got one... Actually, I was surprised that's that way. So one of them is a, it looks like a minx, a, like a cow minx. Actually, I thought it was a dog at first, but I saw the horns. <coughs> like a weird dog. And he's, uh, he's the vice captain under Morley, who I think is the giant. And I thought maybe at first he was, because I think one of the captains is a, uh, is also a minx, but he's like a cat, the one with the gadgets. But no, he's more or less vice and, uh, subordinate. Then we have this girl with dark hair and like goggles, and she she's got a um, prosthetic mechanical left arm, and she's a uh, Bella Betty subordinate. Then we got another guy who I think is kind of like a human, but he's got like this egg-shaped look, 
made me think of like Humpty Dumpty. And uh, 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 their names, the, the cow minx is Oshirnu, uh, the other one's a Hiru, the girl, I'm probably saying these wrong. The Eggman is, uh, yeah, I'm gonna call him Eggman. He looks like an Eggman, he's, but he's got like, he's got like a white uh, dress shirt or something with a bow tie, he's wearing a, a pointed hat, and he's got these plaid uh, suspender pants on. And uh, he's, uh, yeah, he's Lynn Burr's. He Lindbergh's the minx man, the other minx cat uh, subordinate. And the last one is just some other guy who looks like he's very tall, but he's like squatting down next to the others. And he's wearing like a, a, a little mask of sorts, and I don't know what's over his ears, but not headphones. And uh, him, his name is Jiren, and he's uh, the crow man's uh, Kasiru's uh, subordinate. And his name's uh, yeah, Jiren. And he's, um, so him and uh, Jiren and Gamble Oh yeah, so Gamble, right? Someone said he sounds like he's Gamble, like he looks like Gamble, because Gamble says to Jiren, "Let's make a wager on who it is." Uh, it, uh, I wager he wagers. I think it's probably an enemy, and Jiren's like, "No, nah, I bet it's uh, I bet it's Sable. Let's bet one million on it." And it actually, looks like he um, he's eating something there. It looks like he's got he's got something. I was thinking about him like a goat, because he looks like he's eating like a pair of a telescope or something. And uh, we find out that he uh, he knew Sabo. This ship is Sabo coming to them. And Jiren, I think, cheated there in a little wager with uh, Gamble by uh, <clears throat> using a telescope of binoculars to look. And, and then he was hiding the evidence by eating it uh, by whatever means he can do that. And uh, yeah, so we skip, skipped a part where other people are reporting to Ivankov and Dragon that Sabo's made it back. Uh, Oh yeah, they were binoculars. So yeah, Gamble is like, uh, I knew you were you were up to something when you you were w willing to bet a, a million berries on me, Jiren. Oh, you used been you cheated on me, didn't you? And he's like, no, I didn't cheat, and he, he's still eating them somehow. So what happened here too is Sabo. I didn't realize this either. But everyone else I've watched reviews pointed out that. Sabo, when you look back at that chapter, you could clearly see that Sabo wasn't really on Lelucia, like right underneath when they everything got shot, they got destroyed, but he was already leaving on this ship, and he got away with some other citizens. We actually see that young lady that made it out, I, I don't really call her name here, but she's the one that was friends with Ace, and they met in this cover story that was Oda did uh, a long time ago there, before, probably, uh, when he was uh, looking for Blackbeard and he was, uh, she wanted him to take milk to the Marines, I think. So she made it out too. And uh, so everyone's like cheering here that he's back. And uh, the, also the, that one girl with the mechanical arm was about, looks like she got a, has like a weapon in that thing, much like an arm cannon of sorts. And she said I was about to shoot you. So it'll be interesting to find out if she's like, Associated with like Mads or something because she's got that a complete mech arm that's like a substitute for her. Ooh, wait a minute there. How come she's got an arm like that? Actually, I just thought about that. She's got a mechanical arm. What if Kid or Shanks could get one of those too? I, I, I bet Kid would want something like that. Although he's got his mech powers to do it. And also, a Kainu, a Kiji, I mean, has him missing a uh, limb. How does this girl? have this, where does she get this technology that she can, um, she can, uh, just moving my tabs, that she can, uh, that she has this fully prosthetic, uh, very advanced arm here. Hmm. <coughs> so, uh, also, yeah, a lot of cit some citizens here who came back with Sabo. All right, next, uh, next we got Koala and... I don't know why Oda loves to do this still, and I know some of you are like, oh, they're kind of cute together, but and I, I don't think that, hold on. I don't think Sabo and uh, Koala would be like a bad couple or anything, but so, like, Koala does this typical angry, like, I don't know what you call this, Sundere or whatever, these characters, when she comes at Sabo, and instead of like first saying, oh, thank goodness you're alive, She's trying to kick him. She's violent. She's acting very... I, I don't get this. 
Why? This is so frustrating to me. I can't stand these characters like this. But then she dramatically stops doing it and does like hug him. I was I was hug uh, hugged him and she was like she's upset because he didn't say oh he didn't verify he was safe somehow. Like why did you how did you do that? Why did you do that? So I was so scared. Like calm down. He, it is an emergency. What do you think? This this is just the thing that upsets me the most. This always happens when someone either well, it's always either like this where it's an emergency and the person couldn't complete conversation, or two the person have will have gotten hurt and they're they're injured and the the girl still kick that person like while they're injured. I saw that that was done in Bleach with that other Soul Reapers that were injured in kind of Curry Town, Curry Town or whatever it's called in the uh, thousand, Year, thousand Year Blood War arc, the one guy is injured badly, and then Ichigo brought him back to his place to hospitalize him, and there was a girl, there was two of them on patrol, they were, they were new young soul reapers patrolling kind of Kur, Kura town, and uh, she drops kicked the guy, her friend, the other, the female soul reaper, and he's fucking injured. Don't do that shit. I, mm. Anyways. No, Pinky, you gotta wait. The cat wants to go up. So, uh... Everyone's, yeah, so everyone's here is like crying, and thank goodness you're back. Uh... What's he doing? He's like scaring people. So anyways, yeah, so, and Bella Betty... Uh, Bella Betty addresses the people that Sabo saved and came along with him. Um... They, uh, they, she gets all these people, she goes up to him like, I'm sorry about what happened. But uh, now that you're here, I, I've heard you want to join our cause. So w w why don't you go over here and uh, freshen up, and then we'll, get, we'll start getting you to get you into boot camp or something. And the other ones, though, are all like everyone there, including the young lady, are all like, "Yes, we're we, we're ready." And so they're very, uh, yeah, they're not. The events that just happened here, and actually, after that was there was a pirate that was terrorizing their island months of uh, back away. That now that you can see these, some of these other people have become uh, uh, invigorated, I want to say, to uh, help, to join this cause. And so now we see how these people help. Actually, she's using her fruit there. Because she, she has a fruit power that makes her able to really invigorate people. So this is the last, the last bit seen here. This chapter ends uh, with uh, Sabo having a meeting with Crocodile and Ivankov. It's funny though, I was a little surprised here that the other four main captains and even their subordinates aren't part of this meeting. I would think they would be, if I was Dragon, I would think, unless I don't think one of them kind of has a loose tongue, I would thought those other eight would be, should be privy to this meeting. At least it's more, the four other ones. But he, uh, so they go on here and, and Crocodile starts telling Sabo about what happened with Kuma. Oh, Sabo says, I heard what happened with Kuma. And Dragon points out, like, something must have happened where he was programmed to go back to Marizua. I'm sorry we let your work and the others, when you went to rescue him, go to waste. But Sabo's like, oh, that's fine. So Sabo's like, so Ivanka's like, okay, well, what, well, why... You know, what happened? And this is where, so we end the chapter here with Sabo saying, pointing out, like, okay, well, you guys, this is going to be probably something that's even more, even making, make your lives more at risk than ever before. And I'm going to tell you what, I'm going to finish the story of what I so told you I saw at Marijua about the someone sitting on a throne. And it ends right there with that little, like, the cliffhanger of him about to tell them that story. Shit, of course Oda would do that. And I bet any money... I bet any money uh, Oda is not going to fill in on this. Thinking about how he does this, I bet the next time we'll see the Revolutionary Army, it'll be after this, and they'll be making a move. Dragon will have decided what kind of move they're next going to do, and maybe they'll have a little flashback of what Sabo told them, but we still won't. I highly doubt we're going to see from Sabo's point of view how and where or what he saw at, uh, at Marijua. So, uh, I, I know it's going to crush someone like Tekken because he wants to know more, and I dearly understand that, <laughs> but I know Oda. I, you should know, he knows Oda better than me, but I, I am so sure that Oda's probably not going to do that, but it would be great to be wrong this time. The, uh, 
Yeah, so a lot of stuff happened here. I'm going to have to try and do my own uh, post-chapter video sometimes. Maybe I can get a stream going if I can figure out that stream thing. Uh, so what did we get? We had three great, we had three main scenes here today. We had the, uh, the, uh, the Marines, the Cross Guild, and the Revolutionaries. So, and it's, yeah, we still haven't been back to the Straw Hats. I personally want to see what's happening on Egghead first. Myself also. I would love, I, I was a little upset at first that Oda's been spending so much time away from there. I understand this, is, I love this stuff too, but when you have stories like that is coming to a head, I really would, I get a little frustrated sometimes when this stuff happens. Sometimes when it's a book, like I was speaking of earlier, like Dan Brown, I'll sometimes just flip ahead to another, skip chapters like this, and they're just to finish the cliffhanger that the author, like Brown, would leave of some character, the main character, or someone about to die, or some dire situation like that. <coughs> so, anyways, that's my video for today. I'm glad I was able to get through with my voice because it's giving how I feel. But um, uh, so yeah, thanks for watching.